Operability is a very uh, straightforward concept. It's about making software work well in production, in the real environment. A focus on actually making it work where it matters. So you have to think about all sorts of stuff, scaling, restoration, failover, monitoring, clear down, diagnosing, all these kind of things. These are all related to operability. If we improve how we uh, monitor things, how we secure things, how we clear down and diagnose, we're improving our operability. These are traditionally obviously things that from a software development viewpoint we tended to ignore or assume was somebody else's uh, responsibility, but these days with the speed of change into, into production and the complexity of the systems we need to make, address these kind of things as first class um, concerns as part of our software, software delivery. Can't we just give these things to a DevOps? No? Is that right? Is that the right approach? I hear that quite a lot in various places and there's quite a lot of organisations that just would like just to hand it over to one particular person to kind of paint on a bit of operability after all the features have been finished. That's not the way to do it. So stay clear of that kind of uh, way of thinking. We've got to make sure that operability is a first class thing otherwise our systems are going to fail. So really it's a shared concern. There's all sorts of weird and wonderful hashtags coming out at the moment with dev, dev, dev ops and biz, dev, sec, ops and whatever. Anyway, it's a shared responsibility uh, for making sure that our systems work well in production. Here is uh, an, an accurate picture of the, um, the, the wonderful new containerized world with Kubernetes, right? That's what it looks like. There's our shipping vehicle, lots of nice containers on it, all nice and uh, all nice and secure and safe, and, and you know delivering software uh, regularly and accurately and, and swiftly. But really, it looks like this, right? This is generally what, what we've the thing we have to deal with. Particularly if you're running a self-managed Kubernetes cluster, they all look like that right now. Um, so, and that's because it's hard, right? That's because this distributed systems are hard and there's so many moving parts, we can't do this stuff manually. We have to build in operability as a first class thing. Uh, so I don't make any apologies, any, any apologies for that slide at all. If you're busy running a Kubernetes cluster and you don't have any fires at all, brilliant, that's great. Uh, I'd love to chat to you afterwards and discover how you're doing that, but pretty much everyone I've come across uh, is finding it quite tricky. Uh, and a local graffiti artist near to me actually had, has the answer, which is talk more. Talk more between different teams, have more conversations, more high quality conversations about how the software needs to work. And ultimately, uh, an even uh, shorter summary of this session today is talk more between different teams <coughs> to try and establish how the software needs to work to, to try and improve operability. So there's these five operability techniques. By the way, um, there'll be a time for questions at the, at the end of the session. If you really want to, if you want clarification during, um, before that, then feel free to raise your hand, but I might just kind of push the answering of that question uh, to, to the end when we've got a bit of time. But, uh, but feel free to, to, to raise your hand, ask a question if you want. Um, so these five different techniques that I want to walk through. Not one of them is really rocket science. There's no real magic here. It's just there's some important details which really make a difference. Um, so we'll look at what I call modern logging. We'll look at runbook dialogue sheets. We'll look at endpoint health checks, correlation IDs, and finally lightweight user personas. These slides uh, will be online after the uh, talk. So there's no need to, uh, to like make furiously scribbled notes because you'll be able to get all the details later as well. Many of the systems we're building at the moment are um, increasingly distributed and um, unless we take some care in, in how we build it and the kind of uh, the, the tools we apply, it becomes very difficult to observe what's going on in those systems. So this lack of observability for distributed systems is, is what I want to address as the first kind of problem and then a technique to address it. And uh, one of the many ways in which we can address a, a lack of observability is through uh, logging using what I call event IDs 
and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, when we're using event IDs, we, we, uh, we capture and define a, dis a set of distinct application states. Uh, so different specific things that our application is doing. Um, and, uh, and that's basically a, a unique list of, 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 of different things the application can do. We avoid logging absolutely everything, which you might call logarithm. It's actually a real Greek word. Um, but basically, logger area is where we effectively got all sorts of stuff splurging out without any, uh, all sorts of logs splurging out without any um, care or thought. We also want to make sure that we're uh, logging in a way which allows us to do distributed tracing. And crucially, the way in which we go about collaborating on logging builds a shared understanding of our system. If, this, if you've ever sent a parcel online, you might have come across a, a, a website that looks a little bit like this. Um, and if you've, you're tracking your parcel online, and in this particular case, there's three different events that happen to that parcel. There's, it's arrived at the depot, it's now in transit, and it's finally delivered to the, the, the person you're sending the parcel to. So there's three distinct states that that parcel can get into as part of its transit through the system. And we've captured that there in a, in a kind of enum or something at, at the right-hand side. And, and that's, sorry, that's what I call an event ID. The, these, there's three different event IDs here, arrived in transit and delivered. Oops. Uh, and we've also got a kind of transaction trace. We've got this identifier up here, which is used across all of the different uh, journey, parts of the journey that that parcel goes on, and that's what the, the equivalent to that is what we call a correlation ID. So it's some kind of fairly unique identifier which allows us to trace a request or a kind of journey, if you like, through the different parts of the system. So ask yourself this question, how many different interesting states can your application or service or software get into? And that's the key thing, it's interesting states. It's interesting from the point of view of the development team, from the point of view of testers, from the point of view of the business owner, from the point of view of people supporting it in, in live service. Um, at the very least, it's my application has started and my application is stopping, right? So it's at least two and there's probably a few more. So we've got a whole lot of unknown events we've never seen before. We've got a lot of known events. And so actually, we can define a set of events where we just have a single identifier for all of the unknown events. Over time, as we discover more events that are interesting, oh my god, we had a failure connecting to the postcode lookup service, then we can add that as a specific identifier into our um, set of uh, events that we know about. So we're representing distinct states. And in uh, kind of C-type languages, C-based languages, we can use something like an enum. So it guarantees uniqueness of the, uh, of the identifiers inside that set. But there are other techniques you can use as well. And the key thing is that uh, it's a kind of sparse, sparse identifier space, and it's immutable in the sense that once we choose an identifier value to represent, let's say, failed to connect to the postcode lookup service, once we use an identifier for that, we don't reuse it later. So if we look back in time at the logs and we find that string in our logs, or we find that uh, integer in our logs, we always know it means failed to connect to the postcode lookup service. And of course, enum as a, as, a, as a type in these kind of C-based languages has got like four billion different values. So we're practically not going to run out of, of, uh, of um, identifiers. Can you see that at the back? Does that come through? So we've got different kind of um, different kind of IDs. We've got some technical stuff like application started. We've also got some more interesting uh, domain level things, like if, we, if this is an e-commerce application, we've got kind of basket item removed, this kind of thing. Um, and we can flesh this out. Uh, we can, um, if we use the, the enum names in, in a particular way, it makes it easy to search. So just instead of saying added basket item, removed basket item, we've, we've, we can make it easy to search for all basket item things by, saying, by, by just changing how we um, uh, define that enum. And we're logging using these IDs. So when an application hits a particular point, we're, crucially, we're not just logging errors. We're using a kind of execution trace. We're using logging as a kind of execution trace. So 
I might have an identifier which is successfully connected to Postcode Lookup Service, and we make sure that we log that as well. You probably want to use a structured login library these days to make it easier to, to, uh, to parse with, um, with log aggregation tooling. There are some libraries that take this approach already. Here's a good one from uh, Sean Riley uh, called Ops Logger. You'll find that on GitHub. There are one or two other libraries out there and, and patterns for, for, for doing this, but you don't, you don't fundamentally need to do anything particularly special. If you've got your uh, set of event IDs that uh, are interesting events, interesting for all the different people having to work with the software, then you're already uh, most of the way to making this, this technique valuable. So here's an example uh, from the real world. Uh, we, we were involved in helping a client a couple of years ago with, um, that had uh, a video, uh, an online video processing um, offering. Um, and they were taking adverts for, uh, from, for, for TV and mobile streaming. Uh, taking it from the advert agency and then actually shipping it to the TV broadcaster. So this is broadcasting in the UK. So um, ITV and Sky and, and, and uh, broadcasters like that would, would receive these. So it needed to be high throup throughput and we needed to make sure that the audio and video was glitch free. Um, because that would be terrible if, if it had glitches after processing. This is a simplified diagram of, of part of their kind of processing flow. There were some worker jobs here and there's some storage happening at a certain point. The detail doesn't matter. The key thing is that um, there was a, a delay between the ingest and the, and the output and they couldn't see where the delay was happening. And so we started to add in these event IDs at every single interesting stage in the, in the processing. And eventually, it was super clear by looking then at the logs, because we've got very specific event IDs that are human readable, we're easily able to kind of narrow it down to the bit in the middle. So that, that was the, um, that's the reason why this kind of technique really works. So we can discover these processing bottlenecks, trigger some alerts off it, report on KPIs, and then target areas for improvement so we can focus just down on this area. And because the IDs we're using are kind of human readable, it's, you, you're a step closer to be able to talk to the kind of business or product owner about the nature of what's going on in that, in that particular part of the software system. So it helps this modern logging approaches uh, help to reduce time to detect problems. It helps us to have better team engagement because we're talking about what the software is doing, what's interesting for different kind of team members. That's a much more interesting kind of conversation than what logging level should we use for this kind of log output here. That's not an interesting conversation, but talking about the behavior of the application is much more interesting, much more engaging. Um, so spend some time collaborating on what, the, what this set of event ID should be between different teams. Ops people, testers, developers, and whatnot. And make sure you start to plug in some correlation traces. There is a lot more to say on kind of how to make logging really awesome, but that, that's a, those two things are a good place to start. And it's the it's collaboration on this stuff which is, which is the real key, rather than just one team defining it for their own purposes. So the second thing that, uh, the second technique that I want to share with you helps to address this problem, where operational uh, aspects are either not addressed or they're addressed very late in the cycle. This is pretty common. Um, and the technique is uh, called runbook dialogue sheets. And these sheets are effectively checklists for typical operational considerations. As I said to you before, it's not really rocket science, but there's some interesting detail that, that makes, seems to make it work well. And it's a team-friendly exploration technique. They look like this. You can see from the size of the coffee cup here and the orange juice that this is a huge sheet of paper. It's A1 in size, so it's, it's kind of about, just about as, as wide as my arm span. And of course, then you can get a team of people or a couple of teams of people around a physical table. Um, and you make sure you book them out for, let's say, at least two hours, maybe two, three, four, five hours a whole day even. Uh, when we've run this with, with clients of ours, so this is a real session with one of our clients. When we ran this, um, it took us two hours to fill in the, the bits of writing you can see on there, which is what, about eight, eight of the... 30 odd headings for typical operational things. But the, the value is in the discussion that happens. Because what we realized was, we realized there was actually no business service owner for this particular part of the system that they were 
working on, and that's kind of a bit of a problem if you need to have some responsibility around uh, a thing that you're building, and so on. The service level agreements in this case hadn't been defined. We need to know what they are before we kind of build the software in the right way. Um, so all this stuff is uh, creative commons, share alike. So you can just go to runbooktemplate.info, down, download the PDF, print it out at A1 size. The key thing is it's, it's a huge size. So you can get people around the table and they can all feel like they're engaging. And uh, it seems to work really well. If, the key thing is if you get the, do this early on, in the, de in the development phase, get the, make it a kind of development team or delivery team responsibility, bring in kind of operations focused people when necessary to fill in some of the gaps. So these are some of the kind of characteristics, but you'll, you'll, see, you'll see these online. There's a whole load of like 30 odd different things. What are the hours of operation, data processing flows, failover, backup, volume, uh, performance, this kind of thing. Uh, so you can uh, send us a pull request and uh, suggest some extra uh, criteria in here as well. Um, and so as I said, this, is, this helps with early discovery of operational requirements. Um, the output from a session like that should be backlog items for, for different teams to address either uh, development teams, maybe ops focus teams. We're pulling some of the testing, helping to pull some of the testing left because some of the operational stuff that we would otherwise have left till very late in the day, we're now discovering early. Uh, and ultimately it's helping to avoid some operational problems by really discovering and highlighting what we don't know about how the system's gonna work. So again, it's, this will become a theme. This is a, a collaboration technique to make um, to increase the awareness of how the system is going to work and therefore help us to address operational things nice and early. So the third technique uh, is aimed to help address some of these problems here, like why is my deployment failed again, why is pre-prod so flaky, kind of environments that are not reliable or where we've got some sort of degree of unreliability around our environments. And uh, this is very straightforward. Again, it's what I call endpoint health checks. So it's a simple HTTP check, and it's, and it's just a very straightforward and practically kind of industry standard way of assessing the health of any component or application or service. Um, so every, th every runnable thing, whatever it is, uh, exposes some sort of endpoint that is consistent across all of your estate doesn't matter exactly what it is, but the key point is consistent. Let's say it's slash data slash health. And so and if, and at the very basic level, if you hit that component or service and, it's, and that component deems that it is healthy, it returns HTTP 200. If it thinks it's unhealthy, it returns 500. We can specialize it more than that, but this is a good place to start. And each component is responsible for determining its own health and, and viability because it might need to be able to see and reach various other kind of endpoints. If it can't see a database, it, it might then respond saying, actually, I'm unhealthy. There's some, there's some important nuances around how you do that, but um, uh, that's a general idea. It's, it, the idea is that, it's, that the component is best placed to understand whether it is in a viable position to, to offer it, it, its, uh, its service. JSON's probably quite a good response type because then humans and machines can, can see it. So you can hit an endpoint in the browser as a human being just to check it manually, but also uh, uh, it's kind of an API and, and scripts can parse it. It allows us to do this fundamentally. We can build a dashboard very quickly for a given environment and get uh, a sense of health across all of the, the um, services in that environment. And if we've got components that are not really HTTP friendly or don't natively expose HTTP, just deploy a really lightweight service in front of the database that does it for us. I mean, it's very, very straightforward. Um, so there's a little, down here, there's a little helper service just in front of the database to, ex to expose that. And the, what I see time and time again is the value of some sort of dashboard like this, which reflects um, the health of an environment or a set of services is huge. The places that, that I've seen that are struggling with getting software delivered tend not to have one of these dashboards. The places that seem to be succeeding better have a dashboard of, that, that looks something like this. It gives an immediate sense of the health of an environment or set of services. 
here's an example. Like literally, it's called Simple Dashboard, and you'll find it on GitHub. And literally, you download, you, you, you git clone this, bring it down, set some config files in a, in a YAML or, or JSON file, and, and point it at some endpoints, and you get a dashboard. Like, it literally takes five minutes, but you have to have built in your... Um, your endpoint health checks first for, for that kind of thing to work. But in terms of getting a dashboard to show you the states of the environment, it's then so quick to do that. Incredibly powerful. I've got an interesting question for you, actually. I don't know what this looks like in a serverless world because we don't really have environments and I don't, don't know exactly know what you'd point to to tell you whether your serverless function is healthy. I'm not sure what that is. So if anyone's got any ideas, maybe we could chat afterwards and, uh, and we'll see what that looks like. Maybe it's like the right combination of versions of functions deployed? I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's, that's one for, for conversation afterwards. So the point of these endpoint health checks then, it allows extremely rapid uh, diagnosis, or bringing a dashboard up in the first place, but then diagnosis of, of potential deployment problems. Um, it just cuts out all sorts of boring conversations about, oh, is the environment in the right state? Is it not? We're, we're, str we're straight to the point where this environment is not healthy, something's wrong, Let's move on, rather than arguing about um, about flaky environments. So we're just trying to make sure that we learn more quickly when things are going wrong. But here we go again. It helps us collaborate because we've got a dashboard so that the dev team can see it and the ops team can see it, and suddenly we're in a place where we've got a better collaboration point in the middle. Particularly as we're... Uh, moving towards ever more distributed uh, systems, we need to be able to answer questions like this, which container or which server handle a particular request? Which combination of servers handle a request? Uh, we mentioned correlation IDs before, but this is I want to uh, expand on it a little bit. So the correlation IDs are unique-ish identifiers. I'll uh, mention what I mean by that in a second. It allows us to trace calls across machine and container boundaries. And then we can kind of reassemble the end-to-end the -end request later on. When I say unique-ish, I mean it kind of only needs to be unique in the time period that we're investigating something. So if we generally only investigate production or, or, or environment problems in the last sort of two weeks, then it needs to be unique kind of within that window. We don't, it doesn't have to be unique for all time, can be, but, um, um, but the key thing is if, if, a, if, if a service or application receives a request with a correlation ID already in it, then it needs to log, log that. Uh, at, the very, at, the very, uh, at the ingress point, it would generate a new correlation ID because there's, there's no one existing. But if you receive an existing correlation, then you log that, and then we gr and we, cook, um, we aggregate the logs, and then later on we can use uh, the log search to to, to find all of the um, pods, containers, servers, whatever that actually handle that specific request. So here's our video processing um, system again. So the very left hand side where we've got uh, traffic inbound, that's where we generate the unique -ish ID correlation ID and we pass it down through all the different layers uh, so we can see which uh, bits of the system handled that exact request. If, we, if it's synchronous, it's pretty straightforward. We can add like an X header, something like X trace ID like this as an example. And if the header is present, we pass it on downstream. Um, for asynchronous things, we can also kind of capture the metadata around this. So, for example, if you're using AWS SQS, it's got send message, receive message um, uh, methods on there, or parts of the API, and you can add uh, a tuple like this so that you're tracking it even for asynchronous stuff. And then if, if it's present when you receive, when you do receive message, if, if that trace ID is present, then you would pass that on as, as part, of your, uh, part of the downstream processing. And we're always making sure we log that correlation ID when it's present. So we can reassemble the full trace using our log aggregation tooling later. Uh, there's some slightly more fancy ways of doing this. If you're perhaps a, at a bigger scale, um, the, the open tracing uh, library framework, whatever, um, uh, or Pivotal Cloud Foundry, they've, they've got a slightly more fancy way of doing it, which is that you've actually got three different trace element, tracing elements. 
um, that actually helps you to reassemble kind of the full request and it is a bit, a bit of a richer way of doing it. Um, if you're interested, go and have a look. But the key thing is it allows, it allows um, open tracing to produce charts like this where we've got the full kind of trace length across the top, but then we can actually see the individual kind of child traces um, along here, then easily find the longest, the longest running bit in the middle. So it's quite a powerful technique. Um, that um, so th this stuff is, is is open source. The key thing is here is giving us a much greater insight into what's happening in uh, in our system. So using correlation ideas like this, we can de detect bottlenecks and unexpected interactions. Uh, if we didn't, for example, if if we didn't, we might. Uh, we might have forgotten that there's actually a little call out to this little service over here that we thought we'd decommissioned, but actually we can see that we've, that service is still really key in making something work because we're logging the correlation ID when it comes through. Ooh, we forgot about that service. Let's not decommission it right now because we need to make sure that we update the code so that it's not calling that. So it allows us to do things like that. It's increasing transparency and helps us to kind of learn about the system. And guess what? We need to collaborate on this too. Because it's not just we shouldn't just optimize for kind of one team or one kind of persona, one, one type of person, uh, like developers, for example. We also need to kind of bring in the needs of people who are operating the system or making the production side of it work well. Um, so our final uh, our final technique addresses um, addresses the, the problem that often software can be. The software that we're writing can be difficult to use or work with in a production context. So do we have any tools for inspecting the size of queues or for uh, clearing down old data stores or for understanding some kind of detail about how well the system is, how healthy the system is or how well it's performing? And often, certainly traditionally, People who are operating things, if you like, people who were there as ops or, or responsible for the live service, had a very poor time with how some of this software worked. So they kind of, if you like, their user experience was really poor. And that can't be a good thing, because when you're in the middle of an incident, you want to have a good suite of tools around you to help you understand why this software is behaving poorly so that you can restore service, uh, avoid hemorrhaging money, or avoid getting, um, you know, kind of embarrass embarrassing. Um, uh, press coverage, this kind of thing. And the technique here is, is just to develop some lightweight user personas. Um, so it's a way of characterizing um, the needs of people working with the software who are not the primary people using the software. So if we're writing a banking application, the, the primary user persona, the primary user is you know, uh, either commercial or, or, or personal customer, they're trying to log into their bank account, and that's fine, that's, that's a primary persona. But we're, we're talking about looking at the needs of people working with the software in a different context as we're building and deploying and testing it. So developers and testers and ops people have got, have got needs for interacting with the software, but they're, they're, the focus is different. So we use... Uh, we use um, user personas as we would with, uh, with, with kind of uh, uh, normal kind of software where we've, we've got this kind of primary user. We don't need to have them as detailed um, because we're only talking about a small number of people. But some, some typical lightweight user personas would be around the ops engineer or a, a tester or someone working in build and deployment um, or perhaps it's the service owner. What are the needs? What's the needs of the service owner? How do they? How are, how are they able to assess the ef the effectiveness of the software that they're responsible for? So eff effectively, we're considering the user experience um, of engineers and team members when they're working with the software to get it deployed into production, or working with the software as it's in production, helping to operate it, not actually using it as a as a as a primary user. Who uses user personas at the moment? Can you just raise your hand if you use it in any form, even for, for as, a, as a kind of the primary user? 
There's one, two lonely hands. Oh, three. Okay, fine. So not very many. It's worth having a look. If you've got uh, colleagues in your organization who are more kind of front-end focused and do a lot of that kind of user interaction work, go and have a chat with them, uh, get them to talk you through how user personas are used and, and so on. Um, you need to dial down the volume a bit because we're not going uh, the, full, the, uh, the full extent. We're not using all the aspects of user personas. Um, but we're using some of them. And the, the key bits to use are these. The motivations, goals, and frustrations of the people, and because these are quite uh, these are quite emotive, and they so they'll bring out some useful characterizations of how these people need to interact with uh, with your software. So, for example, a typical frustration: it's really hard to deploy this uh, this service. Um, there's no, there's no documentation, or there's no simple install script, or um, there's a load of hackery that I've got to do with the Docker file, or something like this. It, it's that's that's what we're talking about here. We're trying to address the motivations, goals, and frustrations of people working with the software on its way to and in production. Um, and particularly for the, for the, um, from the viewpoint of the operations person, or people in the ops team in that space, think of it like this. What, what data would that particular person or type of person need visible on a dashboard in order to make decisions rapidly and safely? That's an example of the kind of question we can ask. And using user personas to drive improvements in this kind of area um, seems to work well when it's used. And we can build them a dashboard that works well. It helps us to empathize better with people from other roles and capture some missing operational requirements as well. So we might need to build a small administration interface to help us make this software work better in production, for example. So we're collaborating on user needs to, to, to improve our awareness of how the system needs to work. Like I said, none of this stuff is rocket science. It's very fairly straightforward techniques, but they do have a, um, a tangible improvement in how well our software works in production. So it improves the operability of our software. And ultimately, you know, we're, we're here to deliver working software. We've got to... There's no point building it and leaving it sitting in a pre-production environment if it's not working. So if you've got these kind of problems, lack of observability, operational aspects are not known, failed deployments, understanding what handled a request, and um, the ops people complaining that the software is difficult to work with, then uh, these are the techniques we've looked at. Logging with event IDs, this kind of enum-based approach seems to work uh, very well for lots of reasons, including the kind of collaboration aspects. Uh, Runbook dialogue sheets, these big A1 printed sheets. We get everyone around the table and we collaborate on the operational criteria, operational concerns for that system. Um, we can use HTTP endpoint health checks for, the, for all the different parts, moving parts of our system, if you like, so that they're responsible for assessing their own health. Introduce some correlation IDs um, so that we can trace execution through different parts of the system, different paths uh, through the system. We gain a better understanding. We end up being able to uh, work better with other teams as well. And to, to improve the operability of, of software, it can be useful to really attend to the, the needs of people, particularly people kind of on the operations side, but, but elsewhere too, to explore their, their, their user experience, what their needs are, and um, help them make better decisions, help them to operate the software better. And that, I think, is it. So there's, there's a link to the book that I mentioned before. There's some, there's some more detail about some of the stuff I talked about today around logging and, and the Rumbook dialog sheets. In fact, the, the free chapter talks more about the Rumbook dialog sheets. That's, that's what that chapter is about. Um, there's some extra resources, links in the slides, and that's all I've got. <laughs>